Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's Germination Retail Roundtable webinar. My name is Mark Zinkowitz, and I am editor with Germination, and I'm happy to be your host. Today's theme, as you can see on the screen, is do we need regulation to ensure seed quality? Today, you'll hear a very in-depth presentation on how our seed regulatory framework works. We'll talk about the grade tables and why they're so significant. You'll hear about internal quality assurance systems and why they're used as an alternative to the seeds regulations. We'll also talk a little bit about variety registration. And finally, you'll see two seed industry giants sit down together for a meeting of the minds on seed regulatory modernization and what the future might hold. Before we begin, I would just like to thank our retail sponsor, retail round table sponsors, sorry, 2020 Seed Labs and CCAN for their support. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be available on our website, germination.ca, following the event. If you have a question for our speakers, please type it into the chat box at any time, you may see a button on your screen saying request to speak. Uh, please just ignore that. It's much quicker if you just type your question into the chat box. That is the fastest and easiest way for us to receive your question. We'll do a little Q&A at the end of our webinar. Today's speakers are Wendy Yan of the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, Sarah Foster of 2020 Seed Labs, David Harwood of Corteva AgriScience, and last but not least, Doug Miller of the Canadian Seed Growers Association, and Barry Senft of Seeds Canada. Now, just a little bit of background. Uh, as part of the Government of Canada's 2018 regulatory reform agenda, the seeds regulations are being examined with a view to proposing potential avenues for modernization and improvement. This is what we're talking about when you hear the phrase seed regulatory modernization, which is sometimes abbreviated as SRM. Now, Wendy Yan is the National Manager for the Seed Section at the Canadian Food Inspection Agency. She'll be joining us live, actually, for our Q&A at the end of our webinar. But I pre-recorded my chat with Wendy the other day, so I'm going to play that for you now. It's pretty in-depth. It's about 15 minutes, but it's going to really help set the stage for the following speakers that will come after Wendy. So, so sit back and prepare to learn all you need to know about the process of seed regulatory modernization and about the history and function of our seeds regulations. Well, thank you, Wendy, for joining me on today's webinar. Nice to see you. Thank you. Nice to see you as well. Now, you are here to tell us about the SEEDS regulations, what exactly they are, a brief history, what's in them, and the timeline as far as SEED regulatory modernization goes. So I will turn the floor over to you because we're all looking forward to learning more about the SEEDS regulations, exactly what they are, what they do, and how they work. Perfect. All right. Let's get this technology started. Great. Can you see that? I can. Looks very good. All right. Thanks so much, Mark. And good afternoon, everyone. I have a lot of information to squeeze into a short presentation, so I'll do my best to provide some of the answers uh, to the questions that were just asked. And I'll be doing that by looking at why Canada has seed laws and why they might be enshrined in regulation. I'll look at the seed programs, objectives and benefits. I'll take a brief look at the history of the regulations. I'll provide an overview of the seed program, including the role of partners. Then I'll switch gears a little bit and talk briefly about the goals and timeline for seed regulatory modernization. So seed laws <laughs> and quality laws, why do we have them? Canada is not unique in having seed laws. Most countries that produce crops have seed laws, the exception being a number of African countries. And the quality and identity or variety of seed 
cannot be reliably assessed by farmers at the time of purchase. The seed laws protect the farmer by establishing a legal obligation for the seller to guarantee the quality of seed by means of standardized inspection and testing procedures. Those procedures, which may consist of a certification system, accreditation and authorization procedures, well, they protect and promote enterprises that engage in quality seed production and consumers in the commercial sector and small farming communities. And of course, seed is important to Canada. It's the first critical link to the agri-food value chain. It's the vector for genetic innovation in plants. Plant breeding is how we improve crop types so that we can feed the world healthy food and use less resources to do it. And the total economic impact of pedigreed seed production is close to three billion per year but more importantly, it provides the foundation for a $30 billion grain industry. And that makes sense as to why seed is important to the government of Canada. So why is seed quality enshrined in law? It's a good question. <clears throat> and the reason these quality and labeling standards are enshrined in regulation likely has to do with needing legal standing as a deterrent to mitigate fraudulent practices such as grain harvested from hybrids being misrepresented and sold as genuine hybrid seed for sowing, seed being labeled with false variety names, minimum seed standards like bridal purity or germination percentage not being met, the percentage of seeds from weeds or invasive spe species exceeding legal standards, Rules are made for these types of exceptions, but we recognize that most companies, growers, and farmers in Canada produce high quality, well-labeled seed. So why put in rules for exceptions? Canada as a nation tends to rely on regulation, which is preventative, instead of litigation, which is punitive. Basically, the seed regulations are believed to help establish trust in the system, both domestically and in international markets. And the International Seed Federation has said that it expects governments to establish and maintain strong legal protection for seed and plant products through appropriate laws and regulations and to afford, enforce them effectively against those who engage in illegal seed practices. So Mark, one of your questions and one of the reasons to, that I'm here today is to talk about what's in the seeds regulations. And the authority for the seed regulations is derived from the Seeds Act and a legislative tool called the Weed Seeds Order. And reg regulations are basically the rules used to carry out the intent of um, the Parliament of Canada. They're instruments of legislative power and have the force of law. And basically they contain more specific guidelines than the act itself. And so those seed regulations, the programs and policies make up what we call the seed program. And the goals of Canada's seed program are, the first goal I'm gonna mention is consumer protection. And there are regulations in place that help to achieve this goal by outlining requirements around minimum standards, labeling, and varietal identity, which is verified through variety registration and seed certification. All of this helps in preventing fraud. The next goal is protecting the plant resource base. And this is achieved through the prohibition of noxious weed seeds and by setting up a regulatory framework that allows for targeting a level of disease resistance. And that's for those crop types in part one of variety registration. One of the probably the biggest um, drivers for the government of Canada is the economic growth and innovation. And some examples of how the seed regs help with that are the regulatory framework allows a choice for value chains of a crop type to choose continual improvement, for varieties that are allowed to be sold in Canada, or if the value chain sees fit, reduce requirements so that the varieties are allowed to come to the market sooner. We also have harmonized international standards that allow for the facilitation of trade and seed quality requirements and innovative varieties, all of that support the trade of grain. And the, the final goal I'll mention is health and safety. The health and safety aspects of the seed regulation, regulations, they're important, but are minimal compared to the other parts of the program. Some examples are variety registration has health and safety requirements for crop types, which are not eligible for registration. If the levels of harmful substances, substances such as glycoalkaloids, um, ochre toxin and dawn toxin are too high. 
The gray tables have limits for ergot bodies. Also, noxious weeds with anti-nutritional properties can be prohibited entirely, or the quantity allowed in seed can be limited. Um, and safety information for seed that has been treated must be printed in both official languages. The benefits of variety registration, seed certification, and overarching seed standards include the ability to track and trace seed through the pedigreed seed production pathway, the facilitation of domestic trade and the international movement of seed, an assurance of minimum germination, mechanical purity, varietal identity, and varietal purity, the decreased introduction and spread of weeds and seedborne diseases via the seed pathway. It provides an efficient communication system to indicate the quality of seed to farmers and, of course, consumer protection from fraud. And because the rules apply to all, it creates a level playing field for companies and individuals involved in seed production. At its most basic level, the seed regulations establishes standards and requires that information be available. As a result, seed sellers have clear, common requirements for marketing of seed, and farmers have confidence in the accuracy of the information and the quality of seed that is sold. And I think we're all aware that the Seeds Act and regulations have been in place for well over 100 years. As to be expected, there have been many significant changes and additions to the Act and regs over the years. Advances in technology and agronomy have been staggering in this time period. The social, political, and economic landscape are vastly different now than when the Seeds Act was created. However, the need for many of the basic tenets of the Seeds Act and regulations have remained relevant over the years. And that's part of what we're exploring in seed regulatory modernization. Are they still relevant today? And although there hasn't been a holistic look at the regulation in a number of decades, there have been some significant and impactful changes to the regulations in recent years. One of the most impactful was the introduction of the flexible variety registration system in 2009, which allowed for stakeholder value chain decision processes as to the registration requirements for their crop types. There's also been some significant policy changes put in place in this time period as well. Alternative service delivery of seed crop inspection was put in place as, in 2014 as a result of the 2012 budget decisions. The CFIA now formally licenses entities that provide seed crop inspection and individuals who provide private seed crop inspection. Even with the ability to make significant changes from time to time, it's important to take advantage of this once in a generation opportunity to step back and take a holistic look at the regulations. So what exactly is the seed program comprised of? Let's start with variety registration. And the purpose of variety registration is to provide the gov government oversight to ensure that any other regulatory approvals required prior to registration are in effect. And that refers to plants with novel traits and, and other elements. Uh, any health and safety requirements are met, that a variety meets the basic definition of variety, so distinguishable and stable, and it's accurately described to determine the identity and purity. That information related to the identity of a variety is available to the regulator to prevent fraud. To facilitate seed certification and the international trade of seed, including tracking and tracing of varieties in commercial streams. Other important areas of regulation and the seed program include domestic seed standards and labeling. The purpose of seed standards and labeling regulations are to ensure that seed meets minimum requirements for quality and is accurately labeled. Accurate labeling is a portion of how we provide consumer, consumer protection. Standards and labeling helps with the control of weed seeds, seedborne diseases, and provides germination insurance. So for import and export, seed imported into Canada is free of prohibited noxious weeds and meets the minimum standards for purity and germination for the seed in question. Seeds exported from Canada meet established standards for quality and are labeled so that they are properly represented in the marketplace. International collaboration. Other important work done in the seed program includes representing Canada's interests at international seed standard setting organizations. 
Canada is a signatory to the OECD seed schemes and is a member agency to the Association of Official Seed Certifying Agencies. The CFIA also represents Canada's interest at the International Seed Testing Association. Another important part of the seed program is seed certification. The CFIA has developed policies, quality system procedures, specific work instructions, and seed certification programs consistent with the international obligations and import requirements of other countries. The seed regulation sets out the terms and conditions under which seed may be certified, including the requirement for seed crops to be certified by the Canadian Seed Growers Association. And there are obvious benefits to uh, traceability with respect to food safety, but it also helps to increase quality and protect farmers from fraud. And it helps the government of Canada to fully understand the impact of things like PNT situations when they occur in our country and manage the recall of seed if needed. We easily know the full history of any ped pedigreed seed grown in Canada and can speak to foreign governments with confidence of our system and information. So we don't do all of that alone. The CFI relies on regulatory partners, portfolio partners, and other stakeholders to deliver and manage Canada's seed program. And our regulatory partners include the Canadian Seed Growers Association, who are responsible for bridal purity standards for seeds of all agricultural field crops and for certifying crops of seed. And Seeds Canada, administers accreditation and monitoring of industry quality assurance systems for the seed program. And the seed program extensively utilizes alternative service delivery for the delivery of many aspects of the program. Private persons are authorized by the CFIA to carry out many activities associated with import, export, domestic production and processing, seed testing and seed crop inspection. So now I'm going to switch gears a little bit and talk about seed regulatory modernization, as you asked, Mark. So normally, when conducting regulatory amendments, the government comes up with the change ideas after discussing them with a limited number of stakeholders. The co-development approach is to develop the change ideas together with all affected stakeholders. And this process brings farmers and the grain trade into the discussion at the early stages. And they weren't typically part of that limited number of stakeholders in the traditional approach. And the government has signaled that we're going into this with an open mind and that we have an openness for substantive change, if that's what's needed. And even with that openness, we have goals and uh, that we need this process to achieve. And they include adding flexibility to the regulations, including the ability to adapt to new technologies as they emerge. And one of the ways we'll do this is to take advantage of the authority to incorporate documents by reference. Another goal that we want to achieve is determining the appropriate role for government. And this goal gets to the crux of what we mean by openness to substantive change. This modernization process should examine if the major parts of the seed program are still needed today and going forward in the future. If they aren't, we need to plan on how to stop doing those activities. If they are, we need to discuss how we can improve them. Other goals are reducing burden, reducing complexity, improving consistency, and strengthening consumer protection. And even though it wasn't one of our primary goals for seed regulatory modernization, a number of ideas being recommended by the, our task teams also help to mitigate the impacts of climate change, which are, of course, a goal of the broader government of Canada. All of this takes time. The working group and task teams will need to take the time to ensure that these discussions are allowed to happen. And um, the timelines have recently been extended. Uh, we hope to get into Canada Gazette part one, um, which is the beginning of the official amendment process in fall, uh, sorry, yeah, fall of 2024 which means by the time we that period happens and we get into Canada Gazette 2, which is the final part of the amendment process, will likely be in 2025. Uh, we're going to need to start reaching out beyond the working group and task teams on some of the ideas being generated. 
We see next winter as an ideal opportunity to ask the broader stakeholders questions on some of the options and recommendations that have been put forward. So thank you so much for allowing CFIA to be part of this webinar and for bringing attention to this important opportunity that seed regulatory modernization provides. Thank you so much, Wendy. A great presentation, and that will help give us a good footing for the rest of our webinar here when we hear from Sarah and Dave and Doug and Barry. So thanks so much, Wendy, and please hang on the line because we'll be taking questions from the audience at the end of our webinar. I'll be doing that. I'm interested in hearing the next speakers. Thanks so much. Thanks. And so, Sarah, you were going to talk about... Uh, Seed regulatory modernization and grade standards from a seed analyst's perspective and why this is so crucial for you. And so that I guess would be my first question is why in your view, this is potentially a, a major step forward uh, for, for the industry. Well, I think uh, CFIA um, have given us a wonderful opportunity for all of us to express and voice our opinions and concerns um, about modernizing um, certain parts of the seed regulatory system. And um, of course, there's been a number of uh, discussions and I'm, I'm not privy to um, being able to speak about the actual conversations or meetings that we've had, but I can tell you that um, we've been received um, extremely well as an industry by CFIA and there's a definite desire to um, work with all industry players in terms of modernizing our system and so if you if you advance to the next slide um, it should be the um, grade tables yeah. and so thank you so for most of you um, that are working um, in the seed industry, you're probably very familiar with the grade tables. Uh, there are in fact 22, which represent 186 crop kinds. So all seed that's uh, sold in Canada, particularly pedigreed seed and common seed for that matter, has to be tested um, and using these grade tables in order to um, establish a standard. And Canada's very unique in that um, we're the only country that actually have these grade tables. And although um, they appear complicated, and to some extent they are, um, they do offer us a comprehensive way at looking at the standards and being able to give the customer um, some protection and some confidence in a standard that was met according to any of those pedigree grades. Um, the conversation that's going on right now is that can we take these, and I can say this, can we take these grade tables out of regulation and incorporate them by reference for making changes um, going, going you know, forward, um, which would definitely make it much easier for us to um, make some you know changes in terms of whether it's a germination for a particular year that we're you know having some issues in terms of um, seed quality and that type of thing. So um, what I want to show you here with this grade table quickly, um, grade table one represents two crop kinds, um, durum wheat and uh, common wheat. And there are 10 columns that have to be checked off. So as I say, very complicated um, very and very uh, comprehensive in terms of what we're looking for. So you can see that we start with foundation one and two, registered one and two, certified one and two, and common one and two. And um, before seed can be graded, uh, both the purity and the germination have to be available. And then um, if you've gone through the uh, Canadian Seed Institute and CFIA exam for grading to become a grader, you can put a grade on it. Um, so each of these columns um, are worked through. Uh, obviously, we don't see a column for prohibited noxious weed seeds because we're not allowed any. any. 
Um, so the first point that we come in is for primary and then secondary and then total weeds and so on. And you will notice um, that the standards are very high. So on a world stage, we have extremely high standards. And I think the point here with SRN is that we want to maintain uh, a purity that's higher or equal to international standards. We do not want to um, loosen up what, what we're doing in terms of keeping our standards high. So we would do um, one kilo of wheat looking for all these different components. And then if you'd switch to the next slide, Mark, please. So this is um, a typical example of a report of analysis. So um, when CFIA or Agriculture Canada um, back in the late 80s privatized seed testing, we were all allowed through accreditation to have our own unique report of analysis. And so this represents um, the work that is, is um, recorded from that grade table. So for example, we're looking at um, certified seed here of uh, foremost um, wheat, and we've recorded all the contaminants that we've found. And um, there's no grade on this because at this point, uh, we're not allowed to, to grade it unless we're asked to grade or if we're um, an actual grader. So this report of analysis um, goes to the customer. Um, it's okay, you can advance. Uh, so the, the, that report of analysis goes to the customer and if they're a grader, they transcribe all of our information from that report of analysis over onto their grade table, which comes out of the old CSI seed manual, seed um, tech manual. And again, um, you'll see that everything that we found is now um, put onto this grade report and it's graded and um, it makes a Canada certified number one. And as I say, it's only through um, someone having the qualifications to be either an actual physical grader or a uh, paper grader that they can put that um, grade on there. So there's a number of steps here that have to transpire in order for us to be able to um, get that information out to our clients or to any of our end users. But you can see that it's a very, in some ways, a very simple um, way of recording uh, what we're finding. And if you go to the next slide, this is um, widely recognized in Canada. This is the certified uh, blue tag for um, seed that um, is moving in Canada that's issued by CFIA and represents um, a number of different steps that have occurred in terms of crop inspection, uh, variety, trueness to variety, um, the sampling, um, the testing, and then the, and then the grading. And this is where Canada really shines. Um, as I say, we have a very robust system, but we could in fact actually strengthen things a lot more. And there's so much trust in this tag. A lot of people, when they're purchasing the seed, don't actually ask what was in this um, bag, if you like, or in this lot, because they believe and they know, because we have such a strong system, that we're meeting minimum purity standards and meeting minimum germination standards. So, if you want me to stop there, I can. And if you have some questions to me for me around um, what you know, why would we need a regulatory system to ensure seed quality? I'd be more than happy to answer. Yeah, that would be terrific. I know you just got back from the United Kingdom, Sarah. Yes. And, um, and so that's uh, you, you. Last time I spoke with you about this, you mentioned that they have done some things 
in in the UK with regards to to this. Uh, was there anything specific that that you learned over there? Mm. Yes. Well, um, as you know, I trained over there and I worked over there, and I've um, stayed, you know, quite close to some of my old analyst friends. And I had an opportunity to chat with uh, one uh, who actually owns one of the very few private labs in the UK, and um, he said back in about 2006, which is still a long time ago, um, the UK went through um, some actual, you know, modernization and simplification and started to move very much towards a central um, data uh, bank and was relying on a lot of um, digital um, copies of, of, of records, if you like. And so in the UK, they have this government user gateway where growers and uh, seed analysts, um, government can all access um, their, their information that they're inputting. And there's actually four pillars associated with the seed, seed system in the UK, uh, not unlike ours. Um, so they have obviously, um, if you're going to sell seed, you have to get a license. If you're going to grow seed, you've got to get a license. And you have to make sure that before you do anything, um, you have the variety that's on the um, common list of varieties for the UK, much the same as we have here. And um, after that, you're applying for crop inspection. And then after that, you're once the seed is harvested, you're applying for sampling and then testing. And this is all run through. Um, there are, as I say, you know, there's a lot of there, it is privatized, um, but a lot of this runs through the National Institute and also of um, Agricultural Botany and also through uh, FEAR, FERA, which is the Food and Environmental Research Agency. And they collect all this data. Um, so, anyway, there's a, a a certificate or form for crop inspection, which is number two. Um, there's a form five for sampling and seed testing. And then there's a cert 10. And that's the one that's um, probably the most similar to what we would have here as our own report of analysis. But the unique thing here, it's a two step process. It allows you to test the seed and grade the seed in one smooth step and then upload all that information into a central um, database. And it just allows for a lot more smoother transaction, there's less paperwork and everything is done to one standard. And I think that's what we're working towards here too with um, some of our discussions through um, SRM is that we, um, actually have a little bit more in terms of methods um, for things like um, thousand kernel weights, um, vigor, uh, tetrazoleum chloride testing, that we're all using the same method. And I think something else that we're looking for in these grade tables is that it's in use for all crop kinds. And that, you know, we're not, if we've got an unscheduled crop, for example, we have to choose the um, grade table that uh, matches it in terms of seed size. Well, it's kind of like, you know, trying to put a shoe on that doesn't fit because we're only looking for minimums in terms of weeds and other crops and germination uh, standards don't matter. But we still have to test every crop kind that comes through. So we want this expanded so that it's much more user friendly and that these grade tables represent more crops and more tests. Looking forward to seeing what's coming. Well, thanks so much for the presentation, Sarah. This was some great insights and uh, yeah, hang on the line for our Q&A. Thank you. Next up is David Harwood. David is Technical Services Manager for Coteva in Chatham, Ontario. Nice to see you, <clears throat> sir. Hi. Thanks for joining me. And, and um, we're going to talk a little bit about internal quality assurance systems here, Dave. Because Corteva, 
Oh, are you still there? Ah, I am. I, it was breaking up a little bit. I, I heard Sarah really well. I think you're back now. There we go. Yeah, I was just going to say, we're okay. going to talk a little bit about seed uh, internal quality assurance systems for seed and right. what, what Teva does, because you guys actually don't go by the seeds regulations. You use your own internal quality assurance system. And, and you're going to talk a little bit about, about why that is and, and how it works. Yeah, or I might adjust what you've said, saying that we operate within the seed certification system, right. uh, but layer on top of that an internal quality assurance process. I guess that's the way I would uh, exactly char characterize the way we work. So, uh, and you uh, would like me to speak for about 10 minutes, so I'll start the clock. Here. Yeah, that would be um, great. If you can tell us a little bit about Cortevel's internal quality assurance system and, and how it functions, that would be terrific. Yeah. Okay. So just to, for context, uh, as a seed business, Corteva. Is in and alfalfa. Rounded seed business. We sell under two primary brands, the Pioneer Hybrid brand and the uh, uh, Bravant seed. So developed traits uh, like um, insect traits, like the Herculex traits, uh, chrome, another insect trait in corn, Clearfield canola is one of ours, uh, Optimum Gly canola, a new trait coming to the market shortly uh, uh, is another example. So that, Are you still there, Dave? Awesome. I think I think you may be a... cutting out again. Actually, Dave, if if it's okay, I'm just going to turn your webcam off, Dave, and then that might help some of the cutouts. A video off, maybe. Yeah, but what, we should still be able to hear you. Okay. So. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Coming through can you loud hear me, and Mark? clear. Yeah, I'm coming through. You're coming through loud and clear. Oh, good. Sorry about that. That's okay. Um, so I, I, I think the, the last slide was pretty self-explanatory, so he didn't miss much from me. Um, so seed quality, I realize this is a seed audience, seed industry audience. So, uh, you know, the, the basics of seed quality are well known. But of course, we manage uh, all aspects of physical and physiological seed crop. And I'm using corn as just an, an illustration uh, for, for this exercise and uh you could insert canola almost word for word for or instead of corn and everything else would apply to hybrid crops uh self-pollinated crops like soybeans and wheat are not dissimilar in the way we grow them but a lot of the quality assurance is similar um so so with that so we, we're, we're managing the physical and physiological quality of the seed very carefully throughout the production process as illustrated there. Now, the seed quality testing that we do um, is reminiscent of, uh, of, of the standards that Sarah referred to, but has, has some additional, we, we test warm germ. We use two terms internally, warm germ, which is just a smaller seed sample test that is a, a classic germination test done according to the uh, accredited lab uh, requirements for corn. And, uh, and then we, for some jurisdictions where we sell corn, we're required to have a, a 400 seed test. And so we conduct that test as well. But in addition to that, this is beyond seed certification requirements. We do a stress test. We still use the term pioneer stress test. It was developed in the pioneer business um, several years ago, where we really challenge uh, seed corn, we also do the same for canola and soybeans with very cold germination temperatures, imbibitional chilling, et cetera, uh, to, to advance the establishment characteristics of seed under stress. So that's something beyond what is required. And then we do genetic testing to test for trueness to type uh, and freedom from um, or uh, to make sure we're not exceeding standards for adventitious presence of uh, other traits, and as well as meaning other uh, 
other genotypes, you know, pollen flowing into a seed field um, that uh, even though we have isolation may have occurred, or the, um, the presence of genetically modified traits in conventional products is something we screen for very rigorously. So that is, again, beyond what's required by the certification system. And then um, trait purity, when you, if you're buying a corn hybrid that has Roundup uh, in it and uh, an insect trait, you want virtually every plant in the field to have those traits. So we're testing to make sure we have uh, the required percentages of those traits. Again, not something required by the certification system, but something we do. And the seed quality testing internally, it takes us about most of a month from when in the plant we collect a sample through to various uh, quality assurance processes taking place, you know, receiving the sample and then putting it through the various laboratories to do either the genetic testing or the, um, the germination testing. Then at the end of the process, if anything is even towards our standards, We'll have a review by a product line manager. That's what this is, just to determine whether or not we're comfortable using the seed. It, it meets standards, but just, you know. So uh, that that's a process that comes into play sometimes, some seasons more than others, just based on the growing season. This year, for example, soybean seed quality is really a challenge because of the harvest conditions we had last year. So we're doing a lot of really careful scrutiny of the seed quality of batches uh, coming out of the 2021 field season. <clears throat> seed quality testing takes place at, at various stages in the, in the process. This slide got um, mixed up when we uh, transcribed it to, the, to this format, but uh, the, the, there's field testing. Uh, we, we evaluate fields for purity, uh, uh, meaning trueness to type, uniformity, uh, and then as well in a hybrid crop, you're evaluating the extent to which pollination control systems are working. So have you detasseled effectively? Uh, do you have adequate isolation? All those things happen. Uh, and, and our standards for those are above the minimum set forth by certification standards. Um, and then there's harvest sampling and conditioning uh, as the seed actually comes out of the field and into the plant. So it's a, it's a season long process. So with regards to certification, as you could imagine, an organization that is operating at uh, a level that goes beyond the certification standards, um, we're of the view that those standards are pretty rigorous and we don't really need the backstop of a certification system. So we would prefer that we are in a regulatory environment where certification of our seed crop so it's a voluntary use the system, but if you have an internal quality assurance program, quality management system, that you could rely on that process as an alternative to certification. Um, and, and a part of that could be the labeling of seed with quality information sent germinations, the test date for that evaluation, and the percent purity uh, of the seed within the bag. Then the last topic that Mark had wanted me to touch on was variety registration. And this relates to my involvement as one of the Seeds Canada representatives to the seed regulatory modernization process. And I sit on the task team looking at variety registration. And uh, so the Corteva position, among the position of uh, many of the Seeds Canada representatives on that team is that variety re registration is an unnecessary level of regulation in the seed industry. That uh, it, the view of Cortevo is that it stifles innovation and limits the flexibility of the value chain to be nimble and respond as quickly as it might. We, we've got a number of crops that don't require variety registration today and corn, a uh, significant product line for us is one of those. And, and, and it works pretty well. It's a thriving industry. So we think that's a pretty good illustration. And then uh, food grade soybeans, a, another in part of the seed industry we're involved with, which doesn't require registration, does require very quali uh, quality assurance and, and connection with end use markets that are very sensitive to quality. And that's working very well. 
And then the crops like oilseed soybeans were, were just listing varieties. We're not testing them for merit. It, it, it really begs the question, is it necessary? We're just uh, going through an administrative exercise in describing varieties um, through that process. And uh, it, it's really a very, not a lot different than a product uh, or a crop without registration. And then um, canola, there's just quality testing, not merit testing for agronomic characteristics. So again, it's quite minimal today, which begs to, to us begs the question, is it needed at all? So with that, Mark, that concludes my remarks. Hopefully I've uh, fit within your time slot and I'm happy to enter into conversations. Absolutely, and we will be taking some questions very shortly. So hang on the line, David. Thank you so much. Good to see you guys. How are you? Good. Well, excellent. Yeah. I thought it was important to have you both on together to talk about this subject as you're both in a big leadership position at our two seed industry associations, the Canadian Seed Growers Association, Doug, your executive director, and Seeds Canada, Barry, your executive director, of course. And today we're asking the question, do we need regulation to ensure seed quality? Let's just start there. Barry, I'll start with you. As Executive Director for Seeds Canada, what's your answer when you hear that question? When somebody says, do we need regulation to ensure seed quality? What, what would you tell them? Well, I think the simple answer to that, Mark, is of course we do. We, of course we need regulation. Uh, you know, and for me, this is especially an interesting question because I was Chief Regulator, or Chief Commissioner at the Canadian Grain Commission. So I, you know, setting out the, the regulations for the grain industry was of uh, particular interest of, uh, to me. And um, so to that, to that question, uh, uh, yes, for a number of reasons. One, to your point about uh, ensuring seed quality, uh, but it goes further than to that, to give the whole value chain that opportunity for, and confidence to be involved and, uh, and the results being achieved uh, uh, in seed development, um, regulation allows for investment by organizations. It um, it allows for small, medium, and large organizations to that investment. Um, so the the answer is yes. And in in this, um, you know, sometimes when organizations ask uh, for the regulations to be reviewed. Uh, by some, it goes to an automatic, well, you just want the system deregulated. And from a Seeds Canada perspective, that isn't the case at all. What we're, you know, we're approaching this review as is as CFIA entitled it, and that's the modernization of the regulations and if needed, the legislation. So, uh, so yes, regulation should be there. And I think as one speaker put it, uh, to the seed summit, uh, the way he described it was regulations be, should be there as a guardrail and ensure that innovation is, is allowed to occur. So, yes. Doug, how about you? What's your take on that question? Do we need regulation to ensure seed quality? Well, Mark, I think, you know, for our, for our listeners at home, if they're falling around on their common ground bingo card, I think they have one here. But, you know, this is a really interesting question that you pose, but I'm not necessarily sure that it's the right question. So let me put it to you this way. Do we need regulation to ensure car quality? Technically, no. A company isn't going to try to put out a bad car. It's bad for business. But quality doesn't mean the same thing to all people, and C quality is no different. In this case, regulation set a baseline of conditions, checks and balances, in many cases certification, that the car is safe and reliable. A regulatory framework provides buyers with trust and confidence that in what they're buying. And trust is really key here. You know, looking back a few months ago, one of our members, Sarah Wiggum, she did an op-ed in the Alberta Farm Express. In the article, she talks about an author by the name of Stephen Covey. 
and I may have butchered that pronunciation, and it might not be a household name by any stretch of the imagination, but he's the gentleman who wrote uh, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. So most people have heard of this book, but what Stephen has done is he's done a lot of time researching trust. And what he found is that whenever you're looking at trust, it always has an impact on two measurable outcomes. The first one being speed and then cost. So when trust goes down, everything takes longer and it costs more to do so. He calls this, you know, the low trust tax. So when trust is low again, it takes more steps to get the same work done. And as a result, you know, co costs go up. So as we look to the future, it's important that as we approach the regulatory modernization discussion, that we're looking for a regulatory framework that is providing trust. And so at CSGA, you know, our vision for the future is one that is based on trust, that Canadian producers have trust and confidence in the seed that they're planting. And our vision is that, you know, we've talked about this many times through germination and other venues. It's about creating a modern seed system that adapts quickly to change, you know, is creating a level playing field for all stakeholders, is able to really bring in new technology and is transparent and science-based. So to answer your question, you know, seed regulatory, seed regulation isn't just about quality, it's about trust in that quality. Now you've both touched on a common theme, which is that regulation should serve should serve to ensure Canadian producers and companies produce quality seed, right? And as we heard earlier on the webinar, our regulatory framework has evolved over time and regulatory modernization is an opportunity for us to modernize the seeds regulations even more. Now, Doug, I'll start with you this time. From the perspective of the CSGA, what are some key areas of the seeds regulations that need modernizing and why? Yeah, well, as uh, Canada's National Seed Crop Certification Authority, you know, we have an intimate knowledge and appreciation for the seed regulations. And we definitely know where the improvements and modernization can be made. You know, when you spend as much time in the day-to-day -day like we do, you know, you know the system at the back of your hand, you know, warts and all. So last April, and it's hard to believe that it's already been a year, CSA launched a new business plan. And in that business plan, we had 14 key SRM recommendations. We really spent a lot of time as an organization. It took us six months to come up with this new business plan and these SRM uh, positions. Uh, after consultation with our members, our branches and stakeholders from, from coast to coast. And so this plan that we've built, you know, was not a plan that was built behind closed doors. Uh, it, it was a plan that had tremendous grassroots involvement. So as we were developing our vision for the future and our key SRM policy positions, it was important to unpack how the current system operates, you know, looking at the irritants, the pain points and the bottlenecks. Because once you're able to identify, you know, the processes and you know, all the irritants, you're actually able to create the value proposition. So this was really important for us is about finding, you know, understanding how the system works, those irritants to make sure that we're building a value proposition that is going to resonate with the seed sector in the value chain. Now, we could all spend many, many hours here today unpacking you know, the various areas in detail, but at a high level, the issues that we identified were due to inconsistencies and confusions in the system, you know, ranging from things like incomplete data sets uh, to record keeping issues to overly complex uh, reporting requirements and systems, and even to you know, clear, uh, lack of clear authorities. So one example of something that, you know, we'd like to look at in the future is that, you know, looking back in the rear view mirror, the seed regulations used to require that graders report the quantity of seed certified to CFIA. However, you know, the specific authority for that uh, was lacking and the practice stopped over time. So even though, you know, this is common practice for all seed certification agencies in the world to be able to report on the quantities of seed that they've that they're able to do to be able to strengthen the integrity and security of their systems. You know, our system right now, based on a lack of clear designated authority, doesn't have that. And so, you know, when we look towards the future of things that we can change, it's about establishing clear designated authority. And we think that our single window concept, of which we'll unpack a little bit later, is a great, another great example. You know, there's other issues with like things like tags, 
but it's really important to be able to think of or write a registration, the schedules, there's a lot, there's items to be able to unpack across the board. But it's all about, you know, making sure that we have uh, an eye an eye on what's happening globally. So when we look at things like information and record keeping, let's look at like what's happening at the OECD seed schemes with their digitalization framework, the strategies that they're rolling out, you know, how to improve the integrity and trust and all this create new value. Lots of things happening there. So whenever we look at, you know, the two, the couple pain points we've identified today, you know, we really think that, you know, a strong national seed crop certification system supported by a single window framework where, you know, CSJ is acting as the national designated authority on behalf of the Canadian government for all things related to seed certification. You know, we really think that that is the path forward. And so at the end of the day, you know, it's all about putting systems in place that are going to uh, increase the level of trust in our certified seed system and ultimately Canada's seed system. Now, Barry, from a Seeds Canada perspective, what are some of the major changes that you think we need to make to the seed regulations specifically to modernize our seed framework and, and why? Sure. The, the, uh, and before I get into an example or two, the, one of the things I want to preface this by is is that this isn't just about fixing what's what some suggest is broken because that question it came up through uh, our summit it was questioned uh, in the chat line at the summit in in newspaper articles etc what needs to be fixed it, it doesn't seem to be broken and that's that's not the issue at all and yes you know uh and i'll get into that a little later as far as what we'd like to uh to be reviewed, but it's it's not the issue of uh, of what's broken. It's the issue again of the modernization of um, of what's um, what we have today and how do we improve on that. CFIA has given us this opportunity to do that, and I think instead of saying what's broken, it's how do we make it more relevant and and progressive, and again make you know modernize it so. The issue is, as we know in this process, is that review of regs doesn't happen overnight. So anything that we can do in this review, again, to anticipate all the changes that are going on and around us, if we can predict, you know, or give some flexibility in those regulations to accommodate that change, we should be doing it through this review and not just look at, at it as uh, as what's um, what's broken. I think the issue. Is, is looking at you know what our farmer customers need uh, and and we've got some examples of that and and I think the seat summit to us provided some common themes that that we you know were putting forward in our discussion and our thought process uh, from this point forward you know the issue of timely access for our farmer customers uh, innovation allowing for innovation in our regs uh, attracting investment, very important that we, um, again, attract investment by the small, medium and, and large um, companies, a nimble, adaptive reg environment. What is the role of government versus that of private industry? The one that uh, we're spending some time on these days is that of and I guess it's a bit contrary to what um, what uh, Doug has mentioned that instead of sole, sole sourcing some of this issue is one thing we heard from the from the seed summit and since that time from our uh, summit partners is that there is a lot of interest in the value chain in seed development and how do we how do we put that that interest into action and one of the things we're thinking about and, and discussing as we go forward, again, what we've learned from the seed summit and as our members, uh, as our members ponder this issue is an independent standards committee that has a, um, that has broad representation on, um, on, uh, on this committee. And what, what I, again, given my past, uh, my past history, what I, would compare it to is something similar to what the Canadian Grain Commission has in its Eastern Grain Standards Committee, Western Grain Standards Committee, where you have people appointed by the minister to sit on that um, to sit on that uh, committee and to um, and to um, 
make you know decisions recommendations to the minister on that so i think you know given the whole emphasis by this government and by consumers by everyone around to have more transparency to have more people involved and less i think the issue is um, the issue is is how do we how do we put that action into uh, some formal uh, uh, some formality and uh, and again having you know, having one or two organizations almost be the legislator, the judge, the jury, and the prosecutor, I think it's time to open that discussion and that um, that uh, interest up. Now, Doug, CSGA is working to position itself as an authority on seed certification in Canada and abroad. And Barry, Seeds Canada wants to position itself as a go-to seed industry resource for a variety of services. How do these two goals or how can these two goals complement one another? Let's start with Doug. Doug, what's your take on that? Yeah, so Mark, whenever I look at you know what CSGA and Seeds Canada are trying to accomplish, um, there's a lot of complementary aspects here. There's really an opportunity for each organization to really play to their strengths. You know, Seeds Canada, you know, they have, as an organization, you know, being around their, their previous organizations for many years, you know, they have many interests ranging from things like IP, FIDOs, biotech, audits, uh, pest control, product regulations, the list goes on. And, you know, at CSGA, while we have positions on some of these issues and our members have their views as well, it's just not the focus of our organization. You know, as an organization, CSGA is focused solely on seed, seed crop certification, seed certification, standards development, and representing our 3,100 members. So, you know, I'm glad to see you, you framed it as a compliment. Uh, um, you know, some people may see conflict here, but, it, you know, it's the way I see this is that, you know, there's actually two complementary interconnected organizations um, that have a path forward. You know, what, if you're looking at, you know, uh, a nice little sound bite here, it's almost about thinking about it as like a yin, yin and yang situation, you know? Um, so again, that was inter, those complementary interconnected pieces. So as an organization, you know, we've, we've been talking about our positions for many months now, and, you know, we're really proud of our track record as a reliable regulatory partner. And we want to be able to do more on behalf of Canadian agriculture. And so where we think we can have the biggest positive impact is on providing that digital single window that we've heard about for the last number of years, everyone's really excited about um, being able to provide that solution for the industry. And then CSG becoming the main point of contact for the industry and government when it comes to seed certification. So this is a, you know about taking what current CSG currently has uh, with respect to our delegated authority for seed crop certification and being able to expand it to the whole seed certification as a whole. So now when we look globally at like what other mature seed sectors are doing, you know, they've either gone down this road or they're going down it or they've been there for many, many years. So some examples to be able to keep in mind as we're going through seed regulatory modernization, the rest of this discussion here today, is to think about organizations like MAC in the Netherlands, SME in France, you know, NIAB in, in England, and, and Sansor in South Africa. So there are many more examples of what we're, what we're talking about here that are out there already. And, uh, but there's one trend that is clear to us here is that government is delegating a responsibility to a single non-government organization that's the main delegated authority for seed certification. I and mean, when we go back to, you know, complementary systems or complementary organizations, you know, these countries that I, that I rhymed off a little bit earlier, you know, they also have organizations like Seeds Canada as well. So taking the Netherlands in particular, you have NAC, which is handling seed certification, and you have Plantum, which acts in a similar role to Seeds Canada. So all this to say, you know, what we're trying to position here uh, and build through our value proposition is not something that's new, but a trusted evolution of mature seed systems globally. Barry, what's your take on that? How can those two 
those two visions complement one another, CSGA and Seeds Canada? Well, to begin with, as Doug had mentioned, I think there is a strong role for the respective organizations. There's, there's no question about that. I think as far as the term go to, and I think we've used that ourselves, but I think it may be in a little different uh, uh, tone than that might be uh, might be thought, is that we're not we're not thinking of the go to organization to be doing everything that needs to be done in the seed seed development area. In fact, the opposite. I'm just suggesting, uh, just on your last question, suggest the opposite is there needs to be more people involved in it because there's interest in that, and so um, and so. The, the issue is, I think, from, uh, from our comment to that, is that we want to be there for our members, whether it's uh, for a communications purpose, whether it's government advocacy, whether it's information in general that they need, services if they're required, but again, on a competitive basis, so as we do with our former, you know, the former CSI and now uh, client services within, uh, within Seeds Canada. I, and there is differences, and, and, and I don't know, I think sometimes people are surprised that there is differences of opinion within Seats Canada and CSGA. The, the issue is we're two different organizations. Uh, there was discussions about merging five organizations that didn't happen, and that's, that's the world we live in, and I'm quite fine with that. But when there's differences of opinion, they shouldn't be looked at what's going wrong here. Like, why is that? I think the issue is, is, you know, a healthy discussion makes the best decision. And I think we we have mutual respect for uh, each other's organization. And I think that's what's important. And I don't think we need to apologize that we're, we have some differing views. We've got, as Doug pointed out, a lot of uh, harmonized, uh, comments that Doug and I and our executive have talked about and that we're going to proceed on to make uh, uh, seed development a strong environment. So, so I, you know, um, sometimes I think we just get caught up of, because the merger didn't work exactly how some people thought it was. Now, when there's a difference of opinion, the world is coming to the end. By no means, it's great to have that debate and to, uh, and to share our respective views because they're each done from our members' perspective. And well, I apologize for that. That's what makes life interesting. That's true. That's true. That is what makes life interesting, as they say. Variety is the spice of life. And so when you have different views, different ways of looking at things, that's great. So no, we, we have another minute here. I'll fire one more question at you guys before I let you guys go. As we heard earlier, the SRM process will go on likely until around 2025 or so. Where would you each like to see the process ending up by that point in time? If you had to name one or two specific things you'd like to see achieved by then, what would they be? Barry, I'll start with you, and then Doug, you can have the final word. Well, as I mentioned earlier, I'd like to see the end result encompass more of the value chain in a, in a formal way. That would be one of them. I think the other one that the seed industry really can uh, contribute to is the, the this whole sustainability issue that we that is on a lot of people's mind. And we have some answers too uh, for that. So I think uh, having recognition within our, in the innovation that uh, uh, we can bring to the table and the regs allowing for that in innovation um, that would be uh, that would be a big positive for me, you know. Again, the environment that gives the the consumer uh, confidence, um, again, uh, for investment that attracts investment, allows for all the the small, medium, and large players again. So there's there's a cost effective um, cost effective environment. Or, you know, our farmers as a farmer, you know, I as a farmer, the cost of inputs are going on. What can we do as a seed industry? to keep, to assure that as much certified seed is used at a price affordable to our farmer customers. So those would be a couple of mine, Mark. And Doug, last word, how about you? Yeah, Mark, as you were doing your intro there, I crossed my fingers. Yeah. Uh, I thought that that was the timeline because, you know, um, 
every just meeting that we have, you know, the outcomes of that, you know, can shift that. So I think, you know, Wendy's going to be providing a good update on that. But, you know, we all went into this discussion knowing that, you know, this was going to be a marathon. And, you know, it's critically important to have an eye on where you're going. And, you know, you know, 2025 is, you know, it, it's the beginning of another, it's the beginning of a whole other journey, what that future looks like here. But I think, you know, in the next six months, you know, there's a lot of things that we can do as uh, to be able to help move this process forward. So when we look at seed reg mod, you know, people call it a once in a generation opportunity. And yeah, it is that to a certain extent, but we're not going to get caught up on semantics here today. But it's an opportunity to be able to catch up, modernize, and future-proof. And so, you know, it's easy to think, you know, you know put the cart before the horse. Uh, but, you know, of all the meetings that we've had of the task teams, the roundtables of the working group, you know, even the summit, you know, I think there's a lot of agreement in, you know, what that future needs to look like. What, like a system that's providing, you know, safe and trusted, as modern, as effective, whatever kind of buzzwords you want to kind of put in here. But I think, you know, and then what we've been doing here the last little bit is kind of spinning our tires a little bit, getting caught up on, you know, dollars and cents versus, you know, being able to agree on some table stakes for that foundation for the future. So one thing I hope we're able to do here in the future is start to put all the cards down on the table here soon. You know, CSJ believes in a single window. CSJ believes in, in having greater delegated authority. And so these are, you know, in our opinion, fundamental uh, structures of a modern seed system and not something that we can just kick down the road, you know, to 2025, you know, the, before the end of the finish line, we'd be able to have these important discussions now. So the next thing, you know, that I want to be able to do, and I, and I know there's a lot of uh, appetite to do this on, on Barry's side too, is, you know, to start to, you know, build more common ground. So there is a lot of common ground between our two organizations. However, you know, there's some issues where, there, where, there, where there's not. So, you know, once we're able to have these great discussions on the foundations, the table stakes of that next generation seed system with our, with our, in our cool development model, you know, I'm confident that we're going to find a spot where we can make these gaps smaller and create that win-win for the whole sector, the whole value chain, and ultimately Canadian agriculture. So if I sum it up, you know, it's put the cards on the table soon, have those tough conversations, and then also, you know, uh, build that common ground. You know, we have a lot of great people around the table, a lot of great minds, and I think, you know, we're going to come up with some great solutions with through that co-development model of what the future looks like. Yeah, I think so. And I'd, I'd love to talk with you guys about this a lot longer. But of course, we only have so much time on the webinar today. So thank you so much for your insights, guys. This has been great to sit down with you both. Enjoy the rest of your day. Yeah, and thank you for uh, hosting this. Thank you. Take care, guys. At least I chatted with Barry Sen from Peace Canada and Doug Miller from the Canadian Seed Trade Association. So again, if you have a question, please just type it into the chat box. We have a couple of minutes here. Uh, Wendy, Sarah, and Dave, if you're able to turn on your webcams, uh, please do so. That would be terrific. I, I'm going to start off. Um, if you're still with us, Wendy, I believe you are. Ah, there we are. Perfect. Hi, guys. Hi. Wanted to uh, kick off our Q&A uh, with a question, uh, actually, that came in, Wendy, with regards to um, Bill, S Bill S6. This came up last week. Um, and I'm just going to share my screen here so that everybody can uh, see that so we know what we are talking about. Hold on one moment here. Uh, so yeah, Bill S6, there we go. And so, um, Wendy, this came up last week after we uh, actually recorded our talk with you. And Bill S6 is also known as the Annual Regulatory Modernization Bill. And according to the uh, legislation, uh, this helps keep federal regulations relevant and up to date by making common sense amendments. Uh, there's 29 pieces of legislation included. And as far as the seed industry is concerned, uh, the amendments in this uh, bill will, and again, I'm quoting from, uh, from the legislation, will provide clear authority in the act 
for part five of the seeds regulations respecting the release of seed, it would make it explicitly clear that the minister has the legal authority to regulate the release of seed. And the second point is that it will provide authority for the CSGA to determine varietal purity of all seed crops and not just those with grades requiring varietal purity. Can you just talk a little bit about this for those who may have saw this last week who are wondering what this means, what it doesn't mean? Can you just uh, talk a little bit about this and then sort of help shed a little bit of light on, on yeah, what it, uh, what it means for us as an industry? Sure. Can you hear me? I can, loud and clear. Perfect. Okay. There are actually, Mark, that was a good introduction. There are actually three um, change, uh, proposed amendments to the SEEDS Act. The one that you didn't mention was to enable electronic notices, so to change the requirement uh, from sending notices for removal of unlawful imports by registered mail to allow wow. them to be sent electronically. So there's a third one. And, of course, you touched on the foreign recognition. Um, to enable market access and innovation. And then we have a technical amendment, and that's the one um, regarding the pedigreed seed system being linked to the requirement for grading. And that one's in the, um, well, the electronic notices and that and the technical one, they're in the scope of seed reg mods. So maybe I'll just answer with respect to that one. Sure. So yeah. just to, okay. So first and foremost, um, it's considered to be a, a housekeeping legislative amendment to catch up on, you know, to catch up current practices with legislative authority. And so the amendment is needed to provide clarity um, that the regulations enable CSGA to determine varietal purity for all seed crops in Canada, not just those that are subject to grading. And that reflects current operational practices, and that's been in place for years because there's a number of crop types that are outside of the grade tables and it's it's a really small amount they represent uh, i believe the number is 0.002 percent of canada's pedigreed seed acreage production and although this is a small amount it's important that the option for being part of the pedigreed seed system be available so that they're not orphaned. <laughs> like it, it doesn't make sense in today's current context of encouraging niche market opportunities to have varietal determination being linked to the grade tables. And it, but it's really important that I let everyone know that this legislative change and these changes in no way um, preclude ongoing discussions under the broader seed regulatory modernization initiative because I think we all are aware this, you know, the process is examining the pedigreed seed system as well as many other issues to ensure that the seed regulatory framework is flexible and meets current needs and future needs for uh, crop production in Canada. Thanks, Wendy. That was an excellent explanation. That should uh, help clear things up for people, like I say, who uh, saw that last week and who were wondering what it means. Again, if you have a question, just type it into the chat box. Dave, I have a question um, regarding uh, internal quality assurance systems. Do you feel that a seed regul regulatory system of the future could rely more on internal quality systems? Yeah, I think I do. And perhaps that's not a surprise that uh, I would respond that way. Uh, as I mentioned in my remarks, uh, we we have internal processes that we operate with a high degree of rigor and uh, can certainly um, be auditable and, uh, and by an external authority, but uh, you know, the example would be the way we operate. We're, of course, a transnational business. The way we operate in the United States, our standards are just the same. And we uh, we don't have a certification system that we operate under there. Um, so, you know, I think that's probably the, the best illustration. Hmm. And about variety registration, uh, Dave, um, you mentioned uh, that, that you didn't think variety registration was needed. What possible alternative do you feel could it, could exist in its place? Right. I think uh, I think the alternative is just to not have it. <laughs> uh, that, and uh, as mentioned, you know, the 
crop kinds like corn, like food grade soybeans uh, operate very effectively where we we certify those crops today, you know, so we, there's a mechanism to, for the for pedigreed seed production of, of those materials, but there isn't uh, a registration process that uh, formally uh, documents those materials uh, through the, of the variety registration office. Uh, I think when there is a lack of a registration system where there is a, where a crop kind is particularly sensitive to quality, the uh, end use quality I'm referring to, then there, uh, what in my experience, what develops are very good relationships between product developers and end users. And I think of food grade corn as an example, um, where companies like ours engage directly with significant food grade corn manufacturers like Frito-Lay that uh, you know, make corn chips, you know, from yellow and white food grade corn. You know, we deal directly with them. We screen our varieties with them and they select those that they find most suitable for their purposes. So the value chain uh, develops mechanisms that are, are highly effective, uh, that, uh, aren't, that don't require a regulatory element. Sarah, I have a question um, for you regarding seed analysts. Um, and a possibly like a, a center of excellence for analyst training, could seed regulatory modernization help facilitate something like that? Absolutely. Um, this is something that I've uh, talked about on many occasions. I think it doesn't necessarily just have to be for seed analysts. It can be for anyone in the seed industry. Um, so in terms of chemical companies, so things like how to, you know, um, apply seed treatments, um, perhaps have a demonstration site for seed cleaning plants, um, seed sampling, um, how to take samples correctly, um, kind of have some sort of a mock-up system where everyone can attend um, a workshop or actually attend uh, for several weeks at a time. Um, to learn about the entire industry. And in terms of seed analysts, um, as you know, most of us learn on the job um, as an apprenticeship, um, which um, can obviously has worked um, for a number of years. I think we'd be better off if we had a standard, a standardized um, process in terms of what's expected of us in um, you know, with modules for germination and crop types. And I think that um, based on what I've heard coming out of the UK, it's becoming more and more important for seed analysts to be trained to a, a standard um, where we're dealing with uniformity in testing and that we're all speaking the same language. Excellent. I'm just shooting out a quick poll question for the audience, so uh, feel free to uh, to answer that. Uh, Dave, I have a question about uh, again about variety registration. Uh, if if we eliminate variety registration, do we get rid of the pedigreed grades? Can you address that at all? Uh, yeah. Well, I can certainly uh, give my perspective. I don't believe they're connected. I, I think you can have a pedigreed. Seeds, um, like we do with corn, you know, we we grow corn in Canada, certify it, and sell it into a market that doesn't require variety registration. So, I think they're quite independent. Um, maybe what prompted the question was, I do view, or, or you know, Corteva's view of insurance is something we. Uh, would prefer uh, go away that, uh, that that we could opt to rely on internal certification. As a comment here, Dave, in, in Western Canada, many farmers use that. that so, so anyway. Oh, sorry, I think you froze up there for a moment, Dave. Can you just repeat that last part? Are you still there? I'm going to try turning your webcam off. See if that helps. There we go. Yeah, sorry. What what did you miss, Mark? I apologize. 
I missed just the, the last little bit of that question. I'm sorry. Can can you just repeat the very end of your answer? Yeah, I, my point was that there that we would prefer to be able to opt out of certification that we could rely on our internal quality assurance system. We could provide the labeling information that uh, a customer you know, on the package that would uh, provide uh, informative information to producers um, in lieu of the, the blue tag. Hey, Mark, you're on mute. Uh, apologies. There we go. One more comment from someone, Dave. Uh, someone mentions in Western Canada, many farmers use a combination of regional and variety registration data to select the next new variety to purchase. Uh, right. no, no registration would mean no performance evaluation information would be available to the seed end user. Is that something you'd be able to comment on? Yeah, with the same concern was expressed when I've been around this industry. For a long time and, and i was around when we uh as a seed sector uh lobbied for corn to be exempt from variety registration and there, there was concern the ontario corn producers at the time uh, about the dis that 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 could lead to a lack of a public testing and product evaluation system so what the seed industry did at the time uh was said you know that we're committed to that system. System. So we'll and it continue to this day. Uh, and so I again, I think they can be quite independent. That the the evaluation of products in form of a, a, a public testing system can happen in the absence of variety registration. Excellent. Thank you so much, sir. Well, I think that's actually all the time we have left today. So I want to thank our audience for joining us today. Uh, my apologies again for some of the technical hiccups, but I will be smoothing those out for the recorded version. So you'll be able to watch uh, the full version and also the extended talk with Doug and Barry via our website, Germination. Dot ca. Again, the recording will be available very soon. I just want to take a moment to thank our Retail Roundtable sponsors, 2020 Seed Labs and Secan for their support. Thank you to our speakers today, Sarah and Wendy and Dave and Doug and Barry. Thank you everyone for your time. Glad thank to you, do Mark. it. Thanks, guys. Thanks so much. Great to see Greg Mod. Yeah, have a great day and thank you to our audience for spending your lunch hour with us. So this is Mark Sinkowitz of Germination signing off. And again, I shot out a quick offer earlier. Uh, you can sign up to the 2020 Seed Labs uh, incubator newsletter for uh, a six month free trial. So go to the website or uh, scan the QR code and you'll be able to do that as well. So thank you so much uh, for your time today and have a great day, everyone. Take care.